I would write something and people would say, well, that doesn't look like it's going to cause the publishing fuss that happens mm -hmm. to that book. So I thought, great, I don't have to write mine either. Um, but unfortunately, my editor disagreed. And uh, she said, where are the chapters? And I said, oh, I, you know, Lily King's not writing hers. So, you know, I don't have to write mine either. She's like, no, you have to write yours. So I went back and I wrote them and then I kind of like inserted them um, because they're clues. Also, they're moving Jake's story along and um, you have to be careful about how much information the reader has uh, at every point in the story. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where today's guest is Jane Hemp Korolitz, and we are going to be talking about her new book, The Plot, which is a New York Times bestseller as of last night. We just got the news, and it is also a Book Reporter Bets on Selection. Jean's last book, You Should Have Known, was adapted, adapted by HBO as a series called The Undoing, starring Nicole Kidman, Hugh Grant, and Donald Sutherland. And an early book of hers, Admission, was made into a film starring Tina Fey and Lily Tomlin. Oh, and uh, those titles were bets on selections as well. So I guess they're just following my lead. So welcome, Jean. It is so great to see you. Hey, Carol. And thank you for predicting all of these wonderful things to happen. See, it's just there. Like, what bets on? What are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. so let's start with your telling us a little bit about the plot. Like, give us the plot of the plot. So meta. Okay, the plot of the plot. I mean, I'm I'm fascinated by the the lot of the writer, and you know, in, in many ways, it's wonderful to be a writer. Uh, but there are, there are a lot of pretty grim parts of it, and you know, we're incredibly hard on ourselves, and we we always feel like failures, no matter where we are in our careers, and we have certain things that we are. Uh, in a state of deep anxiety at all times about. And one of those things is, is this story mine to tell? Am I allowed to tell this story? I mean, can you imagine how much worse this has gotten in the last couple of years? But even before we were all thinking about appropriation um, in, in terms of ethnicity and gender and all that stuff, we were thinking, did I really write this? Or where did I get this idea? Did I read it somewhere? Because the the truth is we can't always remember where, where every idea comes from. And writers are readers. We're mostly lifelong readers. We've been cramming stuff into our subconsciousnesses for decades. And it's all, uh, it's pretty swampy in there. It's a big muddle. And when we make stories of our own and, and create characters and situations, they're, they're rumbling around with all the other stuff. And there's, always a level of anxiety about what we're what we're entitled to mm -hmm. so um that's why you find that plagiarism um is a common enough uh theme uh in novels and uh for the many people who have pointed out to me that there have been other novels about plagiarism yes i understand that i have read i've read every novel about plagiarism that i am aware of i've in the last few days become aware of others um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's an entire genre of Stephen King novels about plagiarism. Mm -hmm. It's uh, obviously a preoccupation for him as well. So I'm in good company. Anyway, what is the book about? It is about an author, a rather down on his luck author named Jake, who has nothing going on in his career. He's years away from the only uh, success he's had with his first book. He has, he has no project in progress and into his classroom in the uh, MFA program where he's teaching comes the worst of all possible students. He's an arrogant, he's a jackass, he's conceited. And he says, I don't need you people. I don't need you teacher because I am writing the greatest plot and it is foolproof and I'm going to be incredibly famous and successful. And you know, Jake, the teacher wants to dismiss him as a complete fool. But then in a private conference, he actually hears the plot. And he knows to his great distress that this kid is absolutely right. He is going to have a massive success with this book. And um, some years later, he discovers that this student has died uh, without writing his book. And he thinks, 
this is a story that needs to be written. He writes his own book. He doesn't steal a single word. Um, and it does become a massive success. And But it's what happens after that that, uh, that creates a, a very dire situation for him. Yeah. Have I said too much? I hope I no, you have not. No, 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 because you haven't given anything away, which is like, sure. you know, super good, super, super good. I personally loved the uh, students knowing that he's going to have his pen name. That, would, that was like one of my favorite parts of the book. So his name is, I believe it's Evan Parker and he's gonna become Parker Evan for his, for his author name. So this guy is setting up, not just about his book, he's setting up the way the author career is going to be, his persona of what is going to happen and what is gonna be. And I was just so amused like that because there are people that think that that's what you do. I create a name, I write a book, this is the title, this is what it's about. And it's going to get published and they have no idea of anything that went along the way. They right. have no idea about approaching yeah. the editor for handing in the manuscript. Maybe the manuscript works. It doesn't. Or, or actually writing the book. But I mean, the, the, these are the people who come up to us and say, I have a great idea for a novel. You write it and we'll split the money. Yeah. yeah. Nelson DeMille used to say, tell you what, give me 10,000 words. See if you can do 10,000 and then we'll talk. Because yeah. usually they have about four sentences of what yeah. people will do. Yeah. And it's just very, very, very funny. I mean, I admire their chutzpah. I guess I admire their belief in themselves. But at the end of the day, we're not called, you know, throwers of mud against the wall. We're called writers. We have to write. That's that's kind of what we do. So. Kind of what you do. Did you ever, were you ever in an MFA program? Were you ever? I, I wasn't, but, and, and I'm very snooty and horrible about them in this book. But I do want to say that I, you know, I have friends who love their MFA experiences, mm -hmm. felt that they learned a lot. Um, and, I, and, and I also have a close friend who attended uh, a low residency MFA program like the one in this novel. And she also had a great experience. So I'm sorry if I offend anybody. Um, this particular uh, MFA program in the novel is, is at a place called Ripley College. And it is not uh, randomly named Ripley the name Ripley has meaning for those of us who uh, enjoy suspense. Mm -hmm. um, but it, Ripley, this, this program at Ripley College is really a bottom of the barrel MFA program. Anybody can go. You just write your check and you go. And uh, talent, no talent required. And uh, the students are, are pretty dreadful. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, you can tell that Jake knows he's kind of down on his luck. Like he's yeah. got this job. Yeah. But he's just looking like, I'm just going to get through the day. I'm just going to plod. So when he finds this plot, when he finds this idea, it's probably the most exciting thing that's happened because his own work is just not moving. Right. And I think that a lot of people think of arcs of, of authors' careers as here. And they don't realize that even the best have done some of this. There's they, five books in a row. The next one's not so great. It doesn't do as well. The editor changed. The cover wasn't right. The timing wasn't right. And I think that what you're bringing up here is that you may even write a book, but not see success. Absolutely. And, absolutely. You know, and, you and I know many, many extremely gifted authors who have never broken through. And it's not because their books aren't good. Their books are great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, anybody who walks into a bookstore or a library sees shelves and shelves of new novels that are very well published. And, and in a month, they're going to be replaced by a whole new set of mm -hmm. shelves of new books. Nobody can read them all. Nobody can process them all. And a lot of them are just going to disappear. And it's, you know, and it's so sad, especially when you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and there is, there's just this moment also. There's like, you know, the six weeks when the book comes out where the energy happens. And either the energy happens to continue for it or it just goes like this, kind of like quivers down. Yeah. And that's the reason it's like, okay, where's the oomph gonna be at the beginning? And are enough people gonna catch on that they're still gonna keep talking about it? And this it, it, and this particular time in books, in publishing, look, it's been a great year for books in a lot of ways. And it was really because there was no sports, <laughs> there was no movies, there was, look, The Undoing was at least shot and was able to be watched. And as a result, it was a different you know, kind of time of what was going on. You know, for this book, you actually created two different plots. You actually had to do two different stories. Was that, do you knew exactly what you're doing with the crib, crib, which is the other book in the beginning? Right, so the, the novel that Jake ultimately writes is entitled Crib. And of course your viewers know that crib, like plot has more than one meaning. It, you know, it is a, 
represents where you put a child uh, that you presumably love and want to care for, but it also means to steal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, about theft on a number of levels. Say no more, I will say no yes. more. Um, exactly. I, I knew what the plot of Jake's novel was. That's one of the first things I figured out about the plot. Um, but I didn't know all the details. I mean, I, I think often readers don't quite always understand how little, how, what we know and what we don't know when we set out to write a book. So we, you know, we may know the character, we may know the situation, we may know something that happens, uh, but we don't know every detail. And often as we write, we get surprises ourselves. And, you know, everything that Jake has to discover about who is tormenting him because somebody comes out of the woodwork at the height of his success and accuses him of theft. And most of the book then becomes, who is this person? What do they know? What do they want? Mm -hmm. um, and it's his quest to sort of discover, answer those questions before he loses everything mm -hmm. um, that, that gives the propulsion to the rest of the story. But, but when we set out, we know enough to get going, but we don't, and we shouldn't know everything that's going to happen because then it's just a kind of flat, lifeless story where mm -hmm. dots are connected and then you get to the end and it's over. Yeah, well, I just love it's Jacob Finch Bonner, your protagonist finds himself very enviable. He sold over 2 million copies. I feel like it's every author's dream, 2 million copies. And at one point, I love this, the book sits at number two on the New York Times list after nine months at number one. I just loved that <laughs> I, line. I remember once doing one of my book groups with Min Jin Lee and we were talking about her first novel, um, Free Food for Millionaires. And there's a character in that novel who is, uh, a middle-aged uh, house, no, she's not a housewife, she works in a dry cleaners. She lives in Queens and she has the voice, the greatest opera voice on the planet. And somebody in our group said to men, well, you know, isn't that a little far-fetched to have this kind of nobody person in Queens have one of the greatest voices in the planet. And she said, well, this is my book and I control everything. And if I want to make her give her the greatest voice on the planet, I that's my prerogative. And I always, I thought of that when I thought, yeah, we'll, we'll just put them at number one. We'll put them in the Mark Taper uh, theater in Seattle, which I checked has 2,400 seats. And every time I thought, is this a little too far-fetched? I mean, what writer could actually do this? I remembered Gone Girl. Mm -hmm. Gone Girl would have filled that theater. Gone Girl would have, I mean, I'm not privy to Gone Girl's statistics, but I'm sure nine months at number one would not be far-fetched for Gone Girl. So it, it can be done. And why not have it, why not give him the entire fantasy? Right, because we know this kind of success is rare, like Crawdads. Crawdads was at number one for the longest time, was on the list for a long time. And I think it's like so fun, such fun setting it up. I actually look back, do you know that To Kill a Mockingbird was never number one? never hit number one. There was something in front of it. My son and I did all this research with, with the anniversary a couple of years ago. There was something in front of it that was like there for nine months or whatever. And when it had a chance to come back on, when the movie came out, the um, newspaper was on strike. And as a result, there was no bestseller list. So you talk <laughs> about having like zero luck with a big book. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, it's so funny you mentioned her because back in in the earlier times in my career, when I, you know, I was nobody's idea of successful, I used to play this sick, sad game with myself called would I want her career or would I want his career? And for a long time, there was one writer who happens to be a friend of mine who I, I always thought I want her career. And then her career changed and I didn't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the greatest literary career of all time was Harper Lee's because mm -hmm. she wrote one book <laughs> and it was so you know it, it supported her for the rest of her life but she also had critical acclaim but she also had you know she was lionized as a great person and then she blew it by publishing another book I mean she could have gone out as the all-time greatest literary career of all time and right under the wire it all went because we couldn't bear what we found out about Atticus Finch right we didn't want to know that we didn't want to know that. did not want to know that 
And also for years, we wondered who really wrote Truman Capote's book. Did she write it? Did he write it? That was a big story for a very, very long time. Was the writing more like his or like hers? And you're, but she had this mystery surrounding her that could just, yes. And then you bring that other book out. And I also love when Jake goes on tour because you really summed up the author tour. Yes, he's at this big theater, but it's you go in, the people you have to say hello to, the way you have to behave, the things you have to do. And it is this very big time of being on, like going on tour is really from the time you wake up in the morning and do the early television show to running for the plane that everybody thinks is so great, but it's really not. I mean, like- Well, I, I just like to go on record and say that I have never been on a book tour. So- You it haven't. Was a real imagination. <laughs> it's all an act of imagination, but I mean, I've certainly heard a lot of stories. And by the way, there's a great anthology called I Should Have Stayed Home. Do you know that book? <laughs> oh, I don't it, know that one. All writers writing about their most humiliating experiences, most of them on tour. And, you know, they're- there are chapters in there by like well-known writers who are, you know, kill themselves to get to some small town bookstore uh, where they're booked to read and, you know, nobody's there and they don't have the books and it's all like humiliation after humiliation. So, I mean, we, this is all of us. It's, you know, it's probably, probably happened to Gillian Flynn too at some point, maybe not recently, but um, yeah, it's, it's, you, you gotta have a tough, tough, skin I think yeah because I've even been at book festivals and I thought oh this room is going to be really filled and I'm moderating an event and there are 12 people that are sitting there on the Sunday afternoon and you're like really does everybody outside know what's going on in here and you just can't predict yeah. like where people are at a particular moment you just don't know and I think that everybody has this conception that it's all like super fun but you also saw this like you know the plastering the smile on your face yes I'll have that drink and sure I'd love to go out to dinner you know it was very very funny oh very funny. man so I can tell you about my great idea for novel and you write it now we'll split the money, we'll split the money. No, I mean look I, we 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 love readers we are readers we get it i mean there are writers who would walk into this room right now and i would have butterflies because i'm so starstruck and i'm always going to be that way mm -hmm. um, and i want you know that that's fine with me um but but none of these things none of these great huge theaters uh have ever happened to me the only there's only one thing that did happen to me um that i put in this book as something that happened to jake and it was I was giving a reading at my local Barnes and Noble in Princeton, New Jersey many years ago. And I think it was maybe for my second novel. And just before she introduced me, the woman said to me, I read the beginning and the end of your book and I thought it was just great. <laughs> and I remember just looking at her and thinking, man, are you in the wrong job? That's just like, don't ever say that to anybody. <laughs> But, you know, middle and it was fine. It's really good. You know, 50, 50 shades of humiliation, you know, no matter where you are. It's just really funny. I also would love when Jake gets the note, you are a thief. We both know it. He starts sweating, but in his oh, yeah. like, who knows who yeah. does. And then there's that moment. He's first checks on social media. Like, you know, this is going to happen. He gets the note. Does anybody else know? You go to Twitter, you go to every place else. You see if anybody else is talking about you, you're not coming up. Okay. Whew, that's like pretty good. Then something else happens then something and the tension ratchets up and i love because he's going to sit there then and have to decide when to tell his editor when to tell his agent when to tell the publisher the legal team and there you realize that there's this whole other group of people that he's now sitting in front of him and they go like, well did you do this and he's like no i didn't do this and you realize how the lie is just getting perpetrated and i thought it was such a good look at what the business is like because it's not just jake at this point it's yeah, a lot of other people he's, he's are in business with these people. Their livelihood depends on his honesty, mm -hmm. and he feels incredibly responsible. This is all he's ever wanted in his career is to have to be in this room with these people. Um, and he's he's devastated that there's mm -hmm. even you know the possibility that they, you know, they don't trust him or or, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's it, listen. I mean, it's a it's a devastating thing, and. Um, I, I mean, I have been asked, would I do what Jake did? And the answer is no, but it's not because I think what he did was wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think what he did was wrong. I mean, he didn't steal a word from, mm -hmm. he didn't, he barely saw any of his students' manuscript. He, and what, what he does remember, he's gone out of his way not to replicate. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but like Jake, I know how people would feel about this. Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm they uh, 
were aware of it if they thought I had done it. And I am not, I am, I'm not okay with that level of, of uh, condemnation. <laughs> I don't want it. So I wouldn't do it, but not because what he did was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because it, it was an idea. It wasn't a fully fleshed out thing. He just took the idea and ran with it. And the book talks a lot about who owns ideas. And it's an interesting subject. It's like something could have been based on another idea, maybe even unknown to the author. It's where, and, you know, people always say, where do your ideas come from? They come from me living my life. Yeah, thank you. It's not going to be like, I lay down and now I get my ideas. Oh, and now I will go up and write them. It's not like this. It's you're living your life and the idea is coming to you. you know? Well, of course, Stephen King, you know, says I get them in Utica, which I'm actually not too far from Utica right now. So whenever I'm, I'm, I'm driving up there and I see a sign for Utica, I take a picture of it and I send it to all my friends and say, I'm getting more ideas in Utica. I'm right here getting this. Yeah, I'm right there getting this done. So do you work with an outline for the two stories that were going in this book or was it just sit at the computer and start writing? I, I do not outline in any kind of rigid way. I, I, the only time I ever write down what's, what I think might happen is in a situation where I need to provide an outline for the publisher so that they can actually buy the book. Mm -hmm. I've only done it twice. Uh, I did it for my second novel, The Sabbath Day River, and I did it for this novel. Um, and both times, when you go back and look at that piece of writing, the finished book does, is not close, not even close mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to that projection. It's just, I, and I, I don't know that they really care. I think they just want to know that you can, you, that you have, that you are planning for the end of the book. You, you know where you're going at the end. You know where you're going. You, you kind of know where you're going. You certainly don't know everything that's going to happen along the way. And that's a crucial um, suspension of disbelief on your own disbelief. That's mm -hmm. probably not the right way to describe it. I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what Keats meant when he talked about negative capability, but I feel as if he had some kind of poetry version of this in mind that you, 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 you go forward into the unknown and you have to be okay with not knowing what's going to happen. And that doesn't mean you're clueless. It means that you are kind of creating this bubble around yourself where you can be surprised mm -hmm. um, at how things fall into place. Did you write all of Crib, like all the parts of Crib that we see, were those all done and then moved into the rest yeah, of the book? Yeah, um, I actually tried not to write them at all. I turned in the first draft of the plot without any of those chapters um, because I had heard an interview with Lily King in which she discussed, she was discussing her novel, Writers and Lovers, mm -hmm. which, is, which also has a yes. protagonist who's writing a novel all through that novel. And, uh, you know, in the interview, somebody said to her, well, you know, did you ever think you might give us a little taste of the book that your protagonist is writing? And she said, well, I, 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 I wouldn't even consider it because how could it be as great as I'm implying? You know, I would write something and people would say, well, that doesn't look like it's going to cause the publishing fuss that happens mm -hmm. to that book. So I thought, great, I don't have to write mine either. Um, but unfortunately, my editor disagreed. And uh, she said, where are the chapters? And I said, oh, I, you know, Lily King's not writing hers. So, you know, I don't have to write mine either. She's like, no, you have to write yours. So I went back and I wrote them and then I kind of like inserted them um, because they're clues. Also, they're moving Jake's story along and um, you have to be careful about how much information the reader has uh, at every point in the story. Mm -hmm. And there is a twist. Did you know that at the beginning what the twist was going to be and write to it or does that come later and then how to write around it? Well, that I... I knew, and you know, when people say, "Oh, I figured out the twist in this book," they're they're talking about one particular thing, and I, you know, I'm not shocked that many people uh, saw that coming because there are rules about writing this kind of book. You can't introduce last minute new characters. You can't have somebody, you know, be schizophrenic and that's their split personality or their long lost identical twin. You know, you you're working with a, a finite number of chess pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but the real surprise, and I don't think anybody has guessed that, um, or at least nobody's told me they've guessed it, is, is what, what is, is this plot that is so, you know, uh, nuclear that uh, Evan Parker, deluded Evan Parker, not so deluded actually, thinks 
I'm going to be a hugely massively successful author with this mm -hmm. plot. And what, what is it that Jake responds to that makes him think I have to pick this up off the ground and write this book? Mm -hmm. Because this is a story that has to be told. So what is that? I mean, I've read a lot of novels. You've read a, no a lot of novels. I have not come across this particular story. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you have. Mm -hmm. um, mm -mm. Well, there you go. I'm from yep. from now on in interviews, I'm going to say, and neither did Carol Fitzgerald. No, and I didn't say the twist. I, I think I was enjoying the book so much that I wasn't trying to unravel it. You know, right. sometimes you're just sitting and reading and you're just having a really good time. And look, I am not the toughest critic in the world. I mean, I know that there's a lot of this I could never do. I've got 200 pages of a novel that have been in a drawer for 20 years that I haven't had time to go back to. And it's not going to happen because you know how much goes into doing this. So as a result, there are many times I sit there and say, oh, I either saw it or I didn't, but how did I get to there? And it's fine. But this one I didn't see. And I was just, I think I was so caught up in the way he was so twisted in what was going on in his life. And I was thinking now about like the morals clauses that are in author's contracts and how this guy was going to be in big heap in trouble because there might be, and people don't think about this, a lot of money that had to get given back if this whole thing really implodes on him. And I think he's doing the math in his head because the way people are paid is it's your work. It's not like, you know, you just went and made this up and something. So I think I was just sitting there thinking of it from the business and what I knew about the business. And I was, you know, not sitting and, you know, going blah, blah, blah. So what does a writing day look like for you? Do you go, are you the morning person? Are you the all day person? Or are you the whenever person? Um, it really depends on whether I'm writing. I mean, I'm not always writing. I, I have these long gaps between books and it, it took many years for me to kind of be at peace with that it, instead of driving myself crazy with fear and terror that I wouldn't, you know, write again. Um, this was such an unusual thing because this was set in motion just at the start of the pandemic. And then I was up here in this house and my job was to write this book. And I was so grateful that I had Mm -hmm. a job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a project because I was, uh, you know, psychologically, I was not in the best shape of my life because I was very, 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 very afraid. And I had been for a long time mm -hmm. uh, about what was coming our way. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I was the only person I knew who was scared. Mm -hmm. And I figure that's because of all the novels that I've read about this kind of thing. And, and not only novels, I mean, I, I know you don't deal with a lot of nonfiction, but Laurie Garrett wrote a, a nonfiction book back in the 90s called The Coming Plague, which scared mm -hmm. the bejesus out of me. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, followed what was happening in China last, or that fall, fall of 2019, I was really out of my mind with fear. Mm. So suddenly it's happening, you know, I don't, in a, I'm in a different kind of fear now. I'm not afraid that it's going to happen. It's happening. Mm -hmm. And here I am in this big old house with my husband and I have one job and it is to, you know, make this happen. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the book in, you know, four months. And that, that is not a thing that I, you know, if I heard that, I would probably think, hmm, maybe not such a great book, you know, but, um, but it took four months of mm -hmm. not doing anything else, like long, long, long writing days. Um, I, I would say I'm a terrifically disciplined person at all, but this was so uh, propulsive and it, it, it needed to get out. So they were long days and my, my husband would bring me a drink every day at five and that's when I would stop writing. So I can't tell you when I started, but I can tell you I stopped at five and the drink was handed to me. Um, so yeah. He comes in and you can leave your desk. You can leave your desk. But Pretty you know, it is true. it's like, you know, what you did was completely different. There wasn't anything to do. It was like, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to do this. And the timing for the book coming out was like, great, because it's like, everybody's sort of out there more now at this point. Everybody's, you can get to a store a lot more easily than you could before. It, it's not like you're completely locked down having the book come out last year. We work with a lot of authors and a lot did not have a book in 2020. And going in, they were really upset they didn't have a book going out. And I would just send them a note going, aren't you glad you don't have a book out this year? Because, and they're like, you're right. It's really true because yeah. Some people, the, the hardcover and the paperback both came out when you could not get out and do anything about it or see anybody. Yeah. So, 
Now I've read enjoyed many of your novels and I love that people are discovering you now because I've known about you for a lot longer. And after reading the plot, which book of yours do you suggest that people would enjoy next? What do you think? This you know, it, it should be an easy question, but it's not because I've had such a kind of, I, I mean, I, I have danced all over the thriller literary line. Mm -hmm. I've written novels that, you know, didn't even have jaywalking in them, no crime at all. And I have some that are about murders. So, uh, you know, it, it, it <laughs> I, I, I have a very soft spot for my novel, The White Rose, which came okay. out, I believe, it, I wrote it just after 9-11. And it was a very, um, none of my books are autobiographical, but it was a very personal novel because it was really, it's a cliche, but a love letter to the city and the city before, 9-11 mm. um, and it, it's a re a recreation oh you know here's that borrowing of plot again of a an opera called De Rose and Cavalier which uh, premiered in I believe 1910 and it was in turn based on a I think a French novel of the 18th century so here's you know here are these stories that are kind of standing on one another's shoulders. This is why it's so useless to say, well, I invented that or I came up with that. We're mm -hmm. all borrowing from what came before. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a novel with three protagonists and it's basically about a love triangle among these three New Yorkers. And it's a very, you know, there's no crime, there's no thriller aspect, but it's, um, it, 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 I, love, I love the novel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I also love You Should Have Known. I loved Admission. I love a campus novel. I've written two of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't, I, I would I would send people to any novel except for probably the first one. Which okay. Is, you know, okay. You can let that one go. Let that one go. But screen adaptations of your books have ha happened. So let's start with The Undoing. How involved were you at all in the adaptation on that this one? Much. That Zero. much. <laughs> I was so uh, I was so uninvolved that uh, when I did visit the set and I was introduced as the author of the book, <laughs> what people said was, "There's a book." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was I was just completely uninvolved. So th it's not like the actors are going home at night going, "Let me read the novel to see if I'm going to get no, something from it at all." No. I, I just watched a, a for your consideration conversation with Hugh Grant and uh, and uh, Nicole Kidman and the interviewer said, now, how did you become aware of this project? Did you read the book? And I went, oh, you know, there's a book. <laughs> what can I say? It was it was not it was. It was an adaptation in the truest yes. sense. He took yes. the material and he went in a different direction. Well, you know, I was amused because I was seeing a Facebook post from you at one point the night the finale was airing and you said, I can't wait to see who the murderer is too. Sure, and, I didn't know. And you didn't know. And I said, I could tell you weren't joking. It's like, you really didn't know who it was either at that point. I didn't know because my, my novel isn't a whodunit. We know who did it. It's very obvious who did it. It's not about who did it. It's about right. her. Right. Um, but, but they went in a different direction. They, I mean, they told me straight, straight out of the gate, this is going to be more of a, of a whodunit and there are going to be other suspects and Jonathan's going to be the character and Hugh Grant is going to play him. Jonathan is not even in my book. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's around the periphery. He does something that sets the book in motion, but the book is not about Jonathan. So um, yeah, I mean, I was ready. I thought it was Sylvia the friend. Oh, yeah. I, I totally thought it was her, but mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't. And it just shows that they were laying all these little Easter eggs and it was not that person, not that person. Yeah, I really enjoy that. Um, what, there was, I think it was David Baldacci that said years ago, they said, how do you feel about your adaptation? He goes, this is what I do. I get a check. I blow it up. I put it on the wall really big. When they call and they say, I'd like to make the man into a woman, I look at the check and I go, okay. And then they say, we like to do this. And he looks and says, I, okay. He goes, as long as that's good enough, I don't really care. You can do whatever you want from there. It's yours. So it was right. very funny. And I've often thought back, you know, it's like, okay, this is what you want to have. You want to have that you have your book was adapted in some way, shape or form. And it already happened with you with, with admission. Were you involved in admission at all um, as well? Not, not officially at all. I mean, I, I, that was a very writer friendly set because mm -hmm. The director, Paul Weitz, is a playwright. Lily Tomlin's a writer. Tina Fey is a writer. Wallace Shawn is a playwright. I mean, there was just a very pro-writer vibe, and they seemed pretty chill about having me 
uh, having me visit the set, which was nice because a lot of it was at Princeton and I lived in Princeton then. Mm -hmm. um, they gave my son a line, mm -hmm. that was exciting. Um, did you have yeah. a chair? Did you get a chair with your name on it? I did not. Yeah, I was I just not. curious. I was <laughs> curious to do the chair. I think I, that's the part I want. I did give Paul Rudd a copy of the book and he left it on his chair and left for the day. <laughs> Uh, oh, the, the humiliation. Just the thing, things that people don't know. You just assume that they, oh, and they tucked it under their arm and went home and read. No, that was yeah. going to happen. That was going to happen. So you can let go of the ownership when you're doing the film. It's you like, have to. if you can't, don't sell it. I mean, nobody's making you sell it. There have been right. plenty of authors who said, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be involved in that. Right. Like, even Philip Roth had film adaptations. Right. You know, yeah. most of us do. And, uh, if you're going to cling, you're going to be very, very unhappy. Mm -hmm. just, just don't do it. I feel like the plot could be very cinematic. Are you talk, Is there still film deal circling around on that one? No, we're, we're farther than that. We have a, a really nice team that's coming together. Unfortunately, none of it's been announced, so mm -hmm. I can't say anything about it. When you have it, we'll, we'll like share with our readers. Just you know, check back on the newsletter. So back to the plot. Was this always the title? Was it always going to be called? Always, the plot? always, always going to be called the plot. Right yeah. there in in uh, my editor's office when I was up chucking this whole story, I said, and it's called the plot. <laughs> it was, I <laughs> you mean, sat there and surprised yourself and said, "Wow, I just came up with that." <laughs> no, it was. I mean, some of my novels are are obvious titles. And some I, I waffle to the last minute. You should have known was named by committee, a committee of my friends, because we were, I think it was, I submitted it as how could she not have known? And nobody could remember it, including right. me. What's your, what's your book called? It's called, um, how could she not? <laughs> That's not a good sign. So uh, I sent an email to a bunch of my friends. This is what the book is about. And of course, in that book, there was a book in the book as well. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, you know, you should have known to be the title of the book that Grace is writing. That was all removed from the TV show. So uh, they all said, yeah, you should have known. Yeah. Well, they were like, no, Nicole, Nicole could be writing a book. Mm, no, not her. <laughs> you know, well, they, they removed that, that, that whole plot line, but oddly enough, it was not removed from the official description of so you'd see she's written this book and it's about yes. to come out and this, this murder happens. Uh, actually, that's not even in the show. So yeah, Very funny. It's just the way things happen along the way. Well, you know, many times the about the book copy is written before the book is finished for many authors. And I'm reading the about the book copy later on. I'm like, who wrote this? This isn't even what the book is. And it's it's actually kind of crazy because I'll see sometimes I'll see a book being announced, let's say in September for like a May release or June release. And you'll be looking and you're like, they haven't even written the book. Like, I know this person hasn't finished the book. And this is what we dream that the book is going to be about. This is, and I always have this feeling that about the book copy should change at some point to sort of be more what the book is about. And it never happens. It never happens of let's pick up on what the readers are excited about and throw that in as the copy. And it's one of the things in publishing that doesn't change. Was this the, always the cover? Because it's got this really, really cool cover. It's a great cover and uh, I'm not a visual person, so right. I have absolutely no responsibility for this. When they sent it to me, uh, and it was a slightly different version of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at it for a long time and I really couldn't figure out what I was looking at. I handed it to my, uh, my husband, who's also a writer. He looked at it for a long time and he said, is it a dog? So. <laughs> So we, um, you know, we're not, we're not visual people, but once you see it, you can't yeah. unsee it. And yeah. uh, it's obviously a book, but the, the cover is plain with the multiple definitions of the word plot mm -hmm. and it does figure in the book. Yes, totally does. I totally love it. I love that Stephen King, that small guy says, um, it's insanely readable. How was yeah. it like getting that quote? You know? Well, I, I have a very, uh, uh, tortured relationship to blurbs. I think probably most of your viewers know what blurbs are. I am against them. I think they're not good for books in general. And um, I'm, I'm, I remember back in the 80s, Spy Magazine, the late lamented Spy Magazine had a wonderful column called Log Rolling in Our Time, where they would have author A on author B and then author B on author A and just show those quotes next to each other. So when my publisher said, Jean, you have to do this, I said, okay, here, here, here are my rules. 
my rules are I can't know the person. Mm -hmm. And I have to truly, truly, truly admire the work of the person. Mm. And that, that, that was a pretty small group. There were only two people mm. who were sent um, the book. And uh, they both, you know, said these amazing things. But, but I, you know, I didn't think he was going to say anything. And a lot of months went by and we just sort of stopped thinking about it. And literally the day that they were printing the cover, uh, they, they had to say, stop the presses. They had wow. to stop the presses wow. to get the quote on. But we were just, I, I mean, I was beside myself when I mm -hmm. said it. Because I mean, this is the guy who wrote on writing. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I've read every word, mm -hmm. except for the fantasy, because that's just not my thing. But mm -hmm. every word that Stephen King has written since the 1970s. And I truly, truly, truly respect him as a writer. So mm -hmm. I was beyond. I respect him as a writer and as a reader because I yeah. feel like he is such a deep reader, yeah. and he, um, it's not it's not just a like a hobby. It's like what he does. It's like I am completely infused with writing and also reading on an ongoing basis and discovering people and talking about them. And mm -hmm. you know, this is what to do. Um, Kirby Hayborn narrates the audiobook. Did you select her? Do you have anything to do with the audiobook? Him. He's a him. Him. Oh, he's uh, a him. Okay. <laughs> I not only selected him, I was thrilled when I saw his name on uh, on the short list of, of actors. All three of them were great, but I am a Kirby Hayborn fan. And it's not just because he's, you know, he's a great audiobook narrator, but I am a fan of his film work. Um, I I mean, I'm I'm an atheist Jew, as you you know, but I'm I have a fascination with Mormon history. And Kirby Hayborn is a Mormon movie star. Mm -hmm. And I have seen a lot of his uh, films and he's terrific. So when I saw his name, I thought, yes, Kirby Hayward. And of course, he, you know, the sample that I got to listen to was, was fantastic. Oh, that's a great. That's great. I haven't listened to it yet. Do you listen to audiobooks on an ongoing basis? Is constantly, constantly. Constantly. I use Libby, which is the library app. Mm -hmm. And I, at all times, I have as many on the uh, on the hold list as I'm allowed during the pandemic they went from 10 to three it was a disaster for me but uh you're allowed to hold three and then I have a I have a a, a kind of list of about a hundred more um, mm. that I want to listen to so I I just think audiobooks are great I mean a, a terrible uh, narrator can ruin it um, but most narrators are good they're no Kirby Hayborn but they're you no know, Kirby Hayborn I mean really this is like you know terrific so besides being known as a writer, you also have this very successful author book club, may I call it, sure. author book club series called Book the Writer. Yeah. So for people who don't know this, and I've attended Book the Writer events in person, mm -hmm. and I've also gone and done the ones virtually recently, and it's just such a wonderful experience. Tell us more about this, how it came about and whatever, because I think you just it's a whole different career for you and so well done. Thank you. I appreciate that. I remember you were at Minjin Lee's, right? Yes. Um, yes, I was. Um, and a bunch more. Besides, it, it started when I lived in New Jersey, as I did for many years. Um, I had a book group where the authors came. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I moved back to New York in uh, 2013, I thought, let's see if this can work as a business. And, you know, the first my first attempt to do that was to send authors to book groups, mm -hmm. but that turned out not to be um, the way to do it. Uh, groups have a lot of trouble agreeing on things. I just kind of, so I was hearing a lot of, well, I want to do this, but I can't get my book group to agree. So mm -hmm. I kind of flipped the concept and I set up the events. We meet in people's apartments and you register. There's a fee, you buy the book, you read the book, and on the appointed day, you come to the apartment. It's usually a gorgeous apartment, giving rise to our unofficial slogan, which is uh, come for the literature, stay for the real estate. Because <laughs> we in, in New York are always obsessed with real estate. Um, and you, you, know, you come into somebody's living room and there's a glass of wine and there's the author and there are you know, 20 other people who have just read the book and you have these really wonderful discussions. And in the spring of 2020, um, a lot of my regulars were saying, can we go online? And I resisted for a while because I really value the being in the room experience. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually I did uh, give in and we've been online 
since last September. And it's been this huge success because we've been able to welcome readers from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've, they've come from Australia and Syria and South America, and of course, all over America. And everybody has read the book and there's the author and we have these wonderful conversations. So now what do we do in the fall? Well, first of all, we have a great program all through the summer. We have great books this summer. And then in the fall, we're gonna attempt knock wood to be back in Manhattan living rooms. We have mm -hmm. an unbelievable lineup this summer with, uh, you know, Chang Ray Lee and Jumbo Lahiri and um, Heather Clark, who just wrote this massive um, Sylvia Plath biography. And we just have amazing people this fall. Um, I would like to try to maintain some kind of online element. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I am working. Yeah, we'll and have some events online and some in person. I don't know. And it may be for the authors who can't make it to New York, the authors yeah, who are yeah. in Australia, New Zealand. Exactly. So that's what we found has been really nice is we've been able to introduce our readers to some authors. I know we've done, I think it was two from Australia and one from New Zealand that were not going to be in the States. And if they were, a lot of times people do not tour New York. This yeah. is what we learned when we used to shoot these videos in our office. The authors would be brought to New York for their marketing meeting for the planning meetings, for an editorial session. But when the book came out, most people do not tour through New York. So as a result, we were very limited on who we could get. And we'd had to get them the day they were here and there'd be between things and whatever. And now the world has opened up to us a lot more because we can do this. And there's so many more authors you can get. What I loved about your events when we were live is there were, different people in the room. It's not like everyone knew everybody. Some of them knew each other because they were there. And a lot of these people could not find enough people to be in a book group. That's and true. Never, it was never going to happen. And they may not make every group that you did, but they were making a lot of them because mm -hmm. it was this was their way to go out and read. And I just thought it was such a great way for readers to be able to go in and connect. And you were picking which ones you would go do, but everyone had read the book. It was yeah. definitely a requirement. It was a requirement, like, you know, a requirement, but also you could tell from the questions that people had really read the book. And oh, absolutely. And then we're, I mean, I'm as, I'm as kind of stern and finger wagging as I'm allowed to be like, please read the book. I mean, this is, you've got the author there, you know, you don't want to waste their time by saying, what's your book about? You know, yeah. you, we want to we get to that really deep, level and mm -hmm. I, mean, so, so I cannot even tell you well I don't have to tell you how magical some of these conversations mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. but um yeah I mean everybody's there because they want to be there not because it was Jean's turn to pick the book and this is the crappy book that she picked yeah. I mean you, people just sign up for the events that they want to go to and I love it when people come into the room and they say to the author you know I've been reading your work for years and you're my favorite author or they say I never heard of you before but now I'm going to read all your books. Um, I'm so glad I took a chance on this event. It, it's been very satisfying. And look, we really needed the connection this past year. There's no And I love the questions that come from the audience, like just to hear what they're all saying. And, you know, you always see your book, a book only through your lens. And it's interesting when you hear something that you completely missed that somebody else is saying, and all of a sudden hearing that will have you look at the book a completely different way. And sure. you're also hearing, I remember Min, um, that night talking about all the different influences and what had ended up happening with her. And all of a sudden you're seeing the book completely differently. You're like, yeah. wow, Pachinko, I was seeing it on one level and now I'm seeing something else. And Can you believe there were only like eight people there that night. That was such an intimate book group. I know. Two or three months later, we would have had to rent out Yankee Stadium to do I that. Book. Not that we would have, because we're all about the small conversation. But the small conversation. I'll tell you, here, here's my wild card pick for you. We okay. did a book group, and again, we couldn't have done this in person, uh, from London uh, with Sophie Ward, who is a, an actress. And you know, many of us will remember her from the movie Young Sherlock. She was the, played the love interest in Young Sherlock. And, but she's a very familiar face to a lot of us, the sort of masterpiece theater watchers. Um, she wrote a first novel, which had nothing to do with being an actress or a model. Um, she wrote this, this strange, weird, and kind of amazing first novel called Love and Other Thought Experiments, which was long listed for the Booker Prize. Mm. And it was so 
fascinating and amazing. And it was, it was the kind of novel that we were all just dying to discuss with the author. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out in America in September. And uh, she's so articulate and so lovely and charming. Um, it, was, it was fantastic. Oh, add it to the list. Oh, add it to the list. Well, I think it was also fun because you were in the room and everybody was discussing what else they were reading. And yeah. so you also didn't have, you had this like bubble up thing about what everybody else was talking about and what they were doing. So I have attended a couple of years online and I thought they were also very effective. I thought they were very, very effective conversations because we have been doing this thing called our Bookachino Live book group. And we start out with me asking questions. And then ahead of time, we get a couple of people that we know are going to ask good questions and we layer them in and then go to author Q&A. But we feel like, I mean, I don't need to ask all the questions. And we've got a couple of people who go out and read the book specifically for this so they can be on stage asking the questions because up front you could be in the green room with the author before mm -hmm. because you're, but the way Zoom is set up, you have to do this. And it was just really fun to see like, you know, what people are trying all different kinds of books and reading as a result of it. And they're expanding you know, what they might not have just read because, oh, I'm going to go to this and hear about it, you know? It's really good. So what's next for you? So, you know, now the pandemic's over, you know, blah, blah, blah. What are you writing now? <laughs> well, I, I have returned to the book that I was writing when I got blindsided by the idea for the plot. Um, it's a very different book, it's sort of more in the, the white rose vein than in the plot vein. Um, but I think it's going to be great. And I'm, I'm revising that now. It's due in about six weeks and it'll come out next April. Now, what do you like better, writing or revising? What's better, what do you? Revising. 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 Because until you've written that last word, you, you're convinced you'll never be able to pull it off. Mm -hmm. So at least with revising, you know, you've, you've got to the end of the manuscript. You're gonna make it better. But I mean, the terror that you won't be able to write the book is sort of off the table. Off the table. And also, okay, when you write, is it a messy first draft? Like, do you just put it all in and then play with it later? Or are you kind of more meticulous about it? It doesn't feel messy. It feels labored over. But of course, when you go back and read it again, it's a disaster. So you get these wonderful endorphins, you know, when you're, when you are writing the, that first draft and you're going, oh, this is brilliant. This is amazing. This is so awesome. And then you read it and you're like, oh my God, this is dreadful. So you know, enjoy them while you can, but that you don't get to skip the next part. Right, right. But, and still, then, it, 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 but you still have the intense relief of having completed that first draft. And then does it go to your agent, Suzanne Gluck, at the same time it goes to Deb Futter, your editor, or does it go to one first to the other or everybody the other? It usually goes to Suzanne, my agent, but also to my best friend from college, Deborah Michelle, who's a novelist who lives in California. And she's been my reader since the first novel. Oh. And she is so smart and she's so good. And, you know, she'll say, eh, this isn't working or I don't understand what you're doing here or I love this. Um, and I believe her when she tells mm -hmm. me that, which is, mm -hmm. there aren't that many people you believe when they tell you, you know, mm -hmm. great, perfect, don't change it. Yeah, this is also, but this one's really good. Don't change that at all. Don't yeah, change really. that at all. Don't move that at all. She's also, my, my friend from college, Debbie Michelle, has also read everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. She's read all the big scary books and all the mysteries. And I mean, I don't know how she's done it, but she's read everything. But she's reading with perspective then. She's reading from perspective of what's going on in the marketplace and sort of understanding that as well, because sometimes something can be really great, but it's not the market. It's not going to be, you know, and it's sometimes you just have to ratchet it up a little to make it actually work like that. Well, the plot absolutely works. Readers, I see, highly suggest the plot for both plots that are in it. And I do recommend, I'm going to go back and read The White Rose because I did not read that. I have not gone back that early on your work, but yeah. I'm going to go do that. And um, I think, you know, for readers, I encourage you to pick up something else from Jeans. Like go out and read the plot, see what you're interested in, which books you might be interested in reading first, but they're very different. And that's what I love is it's not like I've just been in the thriller mode all this time, or I've just been doing this, or I've just been doing that. And it's also more of a literary thriller. It is not the, like, it's just going to be bam, 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 like this. It's, you know, there's a lot of character drawing and stuff like that. So yeah. as always, it's a pleasure to see you. I look forward to seeing you in person sometime, yeah. maybe soon. We'll see. Oh, I think it's coming. I really do. I really do too. So thank you so much for joining us today. Such Thanks, a pleasure. Carol. 
And to our readers, we look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To.